This week on the show, we have Father Gregory Pine, and we are so excited to share this conversation with you because it's about decision-making and how we use the virtues to do that, what is prudence, and why it would make us happy. So all that and more coming up next. Father Gregory Pine, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks so much. (laughs) Pumped to be here. Let's go. Uh, For our our viewers who... uh, who haven't, uh, who don't know Father Pine. He is a Dominican friar from the province of St. Joseph. He is a active contributor in Pines with Aquinas and God's Planning, which are amazing podcasts that we will link to in the description below. And he is a doctoral candidate in dogmatic theology studying in Switzerland right now. Uh, And he's here to talk about his new book about prudence. So uh, Father Gregory Pine, I had, when I first, when we set up this meeting and um, we heard about the book, I had three thoughts that I will share with you right now. And I think that will mm. kick off this, this uh, description. So the first thought was I was super excited because I got my master's in moral theology. Uh, virtues is in my wheelhouse and I, I love reading and, and, and learning about this stuff. So the first one, I was really excited. The second one, I thought that if Father Gregory Pine was writing a book that we better get reading fast because I was expecting uh, just this 600 doctoral (laughs) thesis pages on uh, just into the depths. And I was still excited, but I was a little... Uh, concerned on our capacity yeah, to read yeah, it. Yeah. <laughs> but it turns out the book is only 160 pages and it's very readable. Very. So thank you for that. Um, for our own sake. <laughs> and then my third thought, was uh, why on God's green earth would it be a good idea to write about prudence right now? Because really there is no one that is just Googling, how do I be more prudent in my life? And so uh, I don't, could you explain a little bit about uh, why did you write the book and, and kind of just tell us a little about it? It would be my great joy. Um, so first off, I mean, first things first, you have to commend you for the bumper with which we introduce your podcast, because <laughs> as I said earlier, it's kind of like Catholicism featuring Kygo. It's got a sweet hit, tropical house type feel. So, you know, like not too heavy, hard hitting in the EDM yeah. kind of family. It's not like Electro House dubstep. It's just more like I'm on the beach. This is a concert. <laughs> let's go. And if there's one thing that I want to communicate to God's people in this day and age, it's that basically. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Yes. Dude. So let's go. Um, yes. Two, uh, mad props on on naming and claiming. So I've noticed actually, um, I've gotten a reputation for just like saying things that are obscure. And at first I was like, what's the deal with that? But then I just, I, I sometimes listen to myself speak and I'm like, dude, Gregor, you, my friend, are a complicated individual. I was like, did you just subordinate a clause to a subordinated clause while using the word hitherto for like it was normal. I was like, yeah, you did, bro. Yeah, because you got problems. Um, you just got to so, own it. Yeah, exactly. Just step into that. And when people are like, are you speaking in late 19th century poetry for fun or are you just stuck on that setting? It's the second one. Um, yeah. So, yeah, God bless everyone and everyone's patience. Um, but, yeah, no, I, I thank you for saying that this book is readable because that was a goal. Mm-hmm. Let me just say that it was continual agony to make it such. Uh, I like to say that this book has a longer gestation period than a, than a baby blue whale, which is a rich <laughs> image and also a terrifying image that I'll never repeat again, except when I repeat it again. Um, so getting to the point, the matter at hand, prudence. Why prudence? Well, because I think that, I mean, when we're talking about prudence, we're talking about making decisions. And I think that in 2022, many people find it difficult to make decisions. We either feel like, um, I don't know, they're too hard or they're too obscure or they're too overwhelming or there are too many possible ways to fail or there are too many consequences that might arise or whatever it is. We just sit before our, our, our decisions and we're just like, um, okay, my options are paralysis, fetal position, therapy, or running around naked in the streets until I'm committed to a sanitarium. It all seem like bad options. <laughs> So it seemed like a fitting juncture to, to, to write a book about prudence. Um, I don't know. Do you think it's a fitting juncture or am I off base or I... should I subordinate a clause? <laughs> yes. 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 I actually really I agree with that. I think the decision making process and maybe it's just the phase of life we're in, we're about to make a lot of big life decisions. And there is in the book, you also talked about the desire we have to sometimes go to the expert. 
And we get stuck in this discernment sitting Mm -hmm. and the lack of action that we're willing to take. And like, if I'm constantly seeking others' opinions, there's good in that. There's good in getting that feedback and that information. But at a certain stance, if I'm having to wait for a priest to give me spiritual direction to make any move, Mm -hmm. like, and so the gift to really learn how to make decisions Mm -hmm. again, to go back and boil that down from the beautiful intellect of St. Thomas Aquinas to really like dive into that, I think was such a gift in this book, especially as we've had this calling to learn to find clarity through action. Mm-hmm. And again, our idea of prudence, uh, being, oh, very cautious and you challenging that with the reality that it is about action. So yes, I do think that this is very important in 2022, especially when everybody's life has been turned upside down for the last two years. They got to make some decisions. We got we to go forward. <laughs> Yeah. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, this pleases me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I recently learned how to say that in German. I live in Switzerland, but I live in the French speaking part of Switzerland, which means that I speak French poorly, just enough to make a, people like raise their eyebrow and say, what, what part of Switzerland are you yeah. from? Just code for like, ah, why do you speak French so poorly? So I'm learning a little bit of German, but das freut mich. That means it pleases me. So here you go. Um, so the idea that we're made for action, I think when you hear that at first, it's like, wait a second. So I should just be like always running from this to that, or I should kind of always go off half cocked, or I should be like kind of, um, <clears throat> what's the word I'm looking for? Like hasty or yeah. unreflective, or is that what you're yeah. suggesting? No, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just saying that we're human beings. And as human beings, we have a whole life to live, right? And that life has a kind of drama to it. It's got a kind of narrative character, but it doesn't assume dramatic shape or it doesn't, you know, it doesn't get told until such time as we, we you know, take possession of our humanity and make decisions uh, with, with the kind of sense that, yeah, we're going to make mistakes or we may sin. Um, we may experience tragedies of a variety of sorts, but the only way through is forward. And the only way mm-hmm. forward is is by choosing and choosing again and choosing again and choosing again. Um, so I think just to kind of draw the strength, draw the courage for the way is, um, yes, yeah, a big goal of the book. I mean, it's just a big goal, goal of, of human life reflected in, in the book itself. Yeah. And what I appreciate, so the, the last three chapters, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, are kind of more on the action piece of, of how do we apply this? But uh, but you spend a good amount of time in, in the in the first part, kind of laying the groundwork for that. And so uh, I don't know what what were your thoughts on why not just jump right into the here's like five tips to making awesome decisions in your life, which is what I might um, title this video as. I don't know yet because I can't just title it prudence because we realize no one Google's prudence. So um, <laughs> so so why, so so why why not just um, yeah jump right into the like here's what you need to do. Why spend the first couple chapters um, really defining prudence and getting into all, all the, the details? Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So a couple of reasons. First is I think I believe I hold. Uh, that the most boring thing in the world is the answer to a question that hasn't been asked. So I think that um, as as readily as we recognize our need in the description of prudence and kind of what flows from prudence, I still think that we need it kind of communicated to us with all of its urgency, um, with all of its importance, if we're going to really ask that question for ourselves. So it's it's not enough for somebody to say like, hey, Prudence is really important. You should think about prudence. You'd be like, okay, I'll think about prudence. You know, like prudence is the name of, you know, like a Dickens character. And she probably like died of heartbreak or exhaustion. She like at a certain point in the book just decided to sit down on a rock and then just gave up on life. It's like, oh my gosh, prudence? Really? Seriously? <laughs> um, so I think if you're going to get people jazzed about prudence, which I would like to do, um, sure hope to, uh, I think that you have to communicate it in terms of happiness what God gives us in order to, you know, attain to happiness and then zoom in on the virtuous life. Because otherwise it just sounds like, you know, puritanical repression or kind of George Bushian caution. It just doesn't really ever sound like something sweet, which it is, in fact. Um, 
But I don't, I mean, like you've studied moral theology, so you've thought about prudence. Do you feel like prudence has a future as, you know, like a word that people could get pumped about, or are we just fighting a, a cultural battle that's bound to fail? I don't know. What do you think? So I do have quite a few thoughts of this, and, and I've been thinking about this for a while in the sense of uh, virtue, in my mind, is the answer uh, to all of the questions that humans have, but we especially as the Catholic church, I think have the biggest marketing problem in the world. We, we have, we have the answers, right? We have eternal salvation. We have a God who loves us and died for us. And we have the best way to live known to mankind. And we can't sell it. Yeah. <laughs> we can't get people on board. So, um, so I agree with you in the need. What I think we've been trying to figure out is how do we make um, the virtues, the moral and the theological virtues, which maybe we can get into here in a little bit, but how do we get these, these human desires that how to live relationships? Well, how do we make that attractive? How do we make virtue sexy again? Because yeah. we've got to. Yeah. Th this is like a little sidebar. -y, um, but I think that like marketing Catholicism is not insignificant. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean, you know, like let's all write self health books and then invest millions of dollars in advertising. Because because I don't think that's it. I think it's about, like you said, appropriating the riches that we have. But oftentimes we're, we're just not as good at others. So, you know, we can identify certain kind of factions, as it were, or, or voices within the culture, which are pretty good at marketing. Like as much as we make fun of love is love or love wins. Holy mm -hmm. smokes. There is some serious <laughs> power to something that's simple, mm -hmm. that's bumper stickerable, you know, or even like um, with respect to the same sex marriage debate, just an equal sign. It's like, what do you do? It's like, no, we're against equality. It's like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, nice work, Chief. You really killed it there with the marketing. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I think this is a time when we're getting more and more savvy. I, I, there's, there's this one guy that I got to know, a family that I got to know in Louisville, Kentucky, the Passive Hume family. And their son, John, um, did a lot of work on a series of billboards that they had for a pregnancy resource center called The Little mm -hmm. Way. And he just killed it. It was like one of the, it was, it opened my eyes to the prospect of us doing better kind of marketing because it was, it was, it, they were just hipster billboards. They were devastating, like beautiful little font, really nice color palette. Um, the way in which it was proposed was very, it was like, not only was it not violent, but it was very modest, which I think, you know, yeah. millennials were like, if you, if you do any violence to me, I'm going to literally curl up in a ball and die. Um, but like little things like you've got it in you just a billboard that just says, you've got it in you. It's like, holy smokes. I, I am 3,000 times as pro-life as I was before I read that billboard. I am jazzed. Um, so just stuff like that. I think that, that now is the time. And you know things like this are ways in which we go about it. But yes, that is, that is a good observation. Prudence, hard to market, but worth it. <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's actually a good point. You know, We touched on how you started the book and – one of the things that really spoke to me was the first chapter is on, are you happy? You know, like, are you truly happy? And this reality that you use an example of a girl <laughs> that in high school, like had to do all the things and signed up for all the things to build her resume to get into the college application process and to then achieve that. And then she goes into college, but she's built this norm of who she was, but are any of those things actually making her happy? Well, she signs up for all of them again, because that's just who she's become. And then as that girl transitions, you know, I easily see in my own life, the question of being able to sit with moms, with women and go, what makes you happy? What fills you up? What is like, and we didn't learn it because we were so busy filling a resume of things that may or may not have interest us. And this reality of learning because happiness, and I, I think in the marketing, happiness is planted in our heart of divine origin. We are all seeking this path to happiness and we don't necessarily know how to get there. Uh, but this reality that we have to learn some of what actually fills us mm -hmm. uh, and through the virtues that decision process becomes easier, which I appreciate it. Uh, just starting the book there. Um, and I, I know that was intentional in, in the idea of, and I like that you said, I, uh, the, we can't answer a question that's not being asked. And maybe if you can expand on that a little bit of how we take that, especially in the virtues or just the faith in general, I, 
to answer the questions truly being asked. Yeah. No, it's, it's interesting. Like I had a professor who used to talk about the quote unquote curse of knowledge. Once you know a thing, it's really hard to go back and um, recall or envision what it was like not to have known the mm-hmm. thing. Mm-hmm. You know, so when you're communicating a truth, we often communicate it from a place of kind of conviction or security mm-hmm. to another human being who doesn't have the same perspective mm-hmm. or the same vantage. But we forgot it. What it's we've we've often forgotten what it's like to inquire. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've gotten like I, I guess. I don't know what it is, but I've gotten a lot of, like a lot less insistent about certain things. I used to like recommend books to people. I'd be like, you need to read this book. <laughs> um, and nine times out of 10, I'm wrong. You know, especially if you recommend GK Chesterton to another human being, I'm just like, I'm all for GK Chesterton. And the person was like, <laughs> yeah. wait, did he just write like three straight pages to set up a pun? <laughs> it's like, yeah, he did, but it's awesome. Right. And they're like, no, it's not. And also I didn't get it. I'm like, neither did I, but I felt good about it. Um, <laughs> but I think that, um, yeah, like, so, okay. So returning to this notion of the curse of knowledge, there's, yeah. there's something that, there's something that we, we lose, right? Obviously it's not, it's not bad to lose ignorance or bad to lose mm-hmm. not yet perfect formation, but we need to be able to, you know, grow in the faith while retaining a hold on the humanity of those who may not walk hand in hand with us or side by side with mm-hmm. us. And, um, yeah, I, I I haven't yet cracked the code as to how to go about that, but I I think like asking questions, genuinely mm-hmm. listening to the other human being, is a good place to start. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's it's funny. Like I used to think that that was condescending and patronizing, but I think it's more and more I see the correspondence between somebody taking the steps and you kind of accompanying them, mm-hmm. and then you know like discipline, doctrine, whatever you call it, like you know, like evangelization. It's just like a, it's, yeah, it's, it's more like aided discovery than it is mm-hmm. like indoctrination. Those are some yeah. jumbled thoughts, but yeah, I, I send it back. It's, it's, yeah. um, virtue inception. Mm. <laughs> That's it. You go three dreams deep, <laughs> you take your totem and then you spin it and then everything goes up from there. There so, you go. So if you just yeah. plant so, prudence. That's right. Three. So listeners, if you want prudence inception, get this book because Yeah, <laughs> let's go. Uh, <laughs> good okay. news is there's no Marion Cotillard who comes after you in the midst of the book. So rest assured. <laughs> You'll be good. <laughs> so okay. I think this this may be a good place to take this where um I don't know if you've ever heard of the OODA loop from John Boyd. So John Boyd was um a famous fighter pilot. Uh he did a lot as far as uh tactical doctrine in the sense of how do we fight wars and um he was uh, very influential especially you know after he died and people kind of realized like oh this crazy dude was actually had a lot of wisdom and and one of the things that he came up with was the OODA loop. So it is uh observe, orient, decide, act. And the idea is in the tactical realm, if you can observe the enemy, get intel, see what they're doing, orient yourself as far as what are they trying to do, the the context behind it so you understand their thought process, then you decide um, to, you know, your tactic that you're going to use. And then at the end, um, you act on that and all of that feeds back into the loop again so that you're getting the feedback. And his idea was, if you can complete this loop faster than your enemy, then you'll win wars because Mm -hmm. you can see what they're doing, you can act, and then before they're able to react, then you can, uh, you know, deal a deadly blow or however that, whatever century you're in. So, (laughs) so, so I was thinking about that in the sense of, of prudence. And, you know, you have some, some of the diagrams in the book and you talk a little bit about as you get into the later series of, of ways that, that we can make decisions as human beings using things like um, taking God's will and virtue and all of these things. So maybe, I don't know, let's, let's tease it out and see where it goes. Um, Father Gregory Pine, if you were to help me make a decision with my life prudently, what were the steps that I could use to do that? Yeah, great question. And um, <laughs> often like a, a Dominican takes refuge in speculation. And then when you're like, hey, hey, how about we be practical? I'm, you know, most Dominicans would be like, great. So, so in order to be practical, we need to start with principles, which is code for <laughs> speculation, you know? Yeah. Um, so here we go. This is, this is me actually trying to be practical. <clears throat> um, let's say that you're making a decision about 
let's make it like a mid tier decision. So up, upper tier decision would be where do you move next or what job do you take next? Lower tier decision would be like, where do you go for dinner tonight? Which mm-hmm. restaurant or do you stay at home? Blah, 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 thus and such. So like a mid tier restaurant, excuse me, a mid tier decision. <laughs> I got restaurants on the mind. <laughs> Cheers. Let's go. Um, a mid tier decision would be like a family vacation for the summer. Okay. Um, so the, the determination will be based on a variety of factors, but you can go through those things, right? So we said, uh, we're going to observe, wait, what was the first O? Yep. Observe. 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 And then there's another Orient. O cause it's Uda. Orient. <laughs> <and side back>. <laughs> okay. <laughs> we can also take it back to, uh, yeah, yeah. we can come up with a, a better acronym. St. Thomas Aquinas. Yeah. You know, we can do no, I think I think those two interface well. So what what would observation mean? Well, you have your eyes with which to see. Okay. Mm-hmm. So you consult your past experience of vacations that you've mm-hmm. taken. Maybe last summer you all went to Disney World and you're like, our kids are just a little too little to really appreciate this. And also, you know, like a couple of them can't ride any rides, which means that we're always like we're never together so one of us is waiting with the one kid the other one is with the two other kids and it's the only time we can do it is during the summer and we're hoping to like escape the heat of arizona and instead we're going to the heat of florida and you know so like you're consulting your experience you might register that one and bath past couple ones blah 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 and also it's super expensive um you just and then, perfectly described our last summer but go on okay. <laughs> God bless you. yeah um and then you know, you, you you may have had good experiences of vacation, but maybe as you kind of troubleshoot as parents, you still haven't found a good one. So then you consult other young parents and ask them what they've done. Like, what are things close by? Like Lake Mead, is that kid friendly? You know, like that's something that we can drive to. Uh, we're not like Jones and to be in the high desert too terribly much, but like, I mean, Grand Canyon up on the plateau, is it cool enough up there? Are there things that can keep a kid occupied? You know, so you, you're consulting with other people. So these are your observations that you that you take into account. But ultimately, you're weighing them against your own humanity. So somebody else might enjoy those types of things, but you might not be an outdoorsy type. Like you listen to Jim Gaffigan on camping and you're like, exactly, right? If camping is so good, then why are all the mosquitoes trying to get inside my tent? Why don't they love it? Um, you know, so you're, you're, you're weighing it against your own experience. <clears throat> and then at a certain point, you know, like you're just you're trying to get down to brass tacks. So you're on the different websites with like Airbnb or Verbo. Or you're on NP, whatever, National Park Service, NPS.gov, you know, looking at places that are close by. You're like thinking about an RV rental so you can save on blah, blah, blah. blah. You're like, you're doing all these particular things and you kind of get a knack for it, right? And then eventually you're going to make a determination that's based on the concrete features of your life, right? Mm -hmm. So how much money can we spend? How much time Mm -hmm. can we take off? What kind of help can we rely on, you know, for the kids? Um, so you're living in real time. You're not just like, you know what I would really love? Like to go to Kuala Lumpur together. It's like, yeah, yeah, cool. But that would cost you $15,000, right? And also that would be a miserable flight of 16 hours from LAX to who knows where. Um, so, so when it comes, okay, people are like, all right, well, Father Greg, that's like a really, really practical example. Like how do I go from there to things which are more complicated and involved? I would just say you kind of extend the logic. And then you apply it in those circumstances. So if we were to draw principles based on the UDA method, you're observing, all right? So you're observing what you've done, what others have done. You're drawing those together. You're kind of synthesizing them, all right? You're orienting, which is to say, like, you're, you're, you're making it to interface with the concrete and particular circumstances of your life. Like, what's my time frame? What's my budget? Mm-hmm. What are the kids like? What are they capable of? What do I like? What am I capable of? When's the last time I actually asked myself what I like? Should I ask myself what I like for the next 20 years? And why just going to continually put that to the side as the children <laughs> invade our bedroom and keep us up between like, you know, seven to nine hours a night? God bless, whatever. All right. <laughs> um, you know, just theoretically. Yeah, uh, yeah, and just- then... <laughs> <laughs> And then you decide. And I think that for a lot of people, deciding means you make a provisional decision and then you anguish and agonize about it more. You constantly revisit it. You cancel the thing. You you re-up the thing. You cancel the thing. You've like got like $17,000 worth of vouchers from Delta at this point because you're like, it's COVID, so I can book, but I can't get the money back and think. No, it's just like you decide, just full send. Will it be ideal? You know, like as you act, you're going to reap the harvest of whatever seeds you've Mm -hmm. sown and you're going to make judgment based on them with an eye towards not like having better consequences in the future, but, but being more virtuous in the future. Because like what you want to do in the course of this thing is love your family. 
you know, and, and have your family grow in love and open a space in the context of your family life for that to happen. And you can do that in, you know, Lake Mead National Recreation Area, the Mojave Desert, even though you'll be sweating your faces off. Um, or you can do it, you know, like up in the mountains in Colorado, if you're mm-hmm. willing to drive an extra six hours and get a little cool and Estes Park is calling your name, and, you know, like you can do that wherever. <laughs> so it helps you to trivialize the, the concrete particulars with the expectation that like what we're doing is for love, right? If I mm-hmm. relax, God be praised, but family vacations, be, like when your kids are little, am I ever going to relax? Like, let's be honest. Yeah. Okay. I just talked for way too long, but I try to be practical. (laughs) No, I think that's definitely practical. And I think a lot of that was within the book and it was cool to see it applied uh, to just a very, very much a decision we need to make right now as we plan our summer. Uh, But the reality that it is a loop, because I think too, when we make that action, we sometimes think that we're making an action that's eternal. Mm -hmm. I'm very solemn. Are actions going to be like that long lasting? And God's going to give us the grace in it as well. And so as we go back into the loop, we're going to then have that memory to go back through the process of taking the judgments of other people and taking that insight and to make a better decision the next round. But if we never made the first decision, we don't actually have the information to make a better decision. And so we can get stuck. Mm. never actually like going forward because we are just in that paralysis and in that discernment. I'm just Mm. discerning and discerning and I'm still discerning. And it's, well, yeah, we got to take a little bit of action so that you can discern the next thing. Well, let's let's keep going. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think, um, two things that you said kind of stood out. Maybe we can pull the thread on this and Mm. see what unravels. So in the, the decision-making process, one of the biggest things that you talk about in the book is uh, almost not necessarily what you want to have happen, but who you want to become mm-hmm. and, and bringing that into the decision-making process of, of not just, will this make me happy? And, and you start off the book with happiness and there's different layers of happiness. I don't know if we'll have time to get into them, but essentially, you know, the kind of the most surface level uh, is going to fade off. So, so that, that's probably not the question that you should be asking of the pleasure. The ple- yeah. And of, uh, is this going to give me pleasure in, you know, in this next process, we need to be thinking more long range of who do I want to become? Who do I, who does God want me to be? And so, and from that lens, now you can start to orient those decisions of say the, the family, uh, road trip, you know, you go, oh, well, well, this would be cool, but we don't have access to a church. And we're like, well, our family vision is to help our kids become saints and and to help other people become saints. And so uh, does that fit with who God wants us to be and, and our, you know, who we want our kids to be? And then the answer is like, well, no, obviously, because um, because we should go to church on Sunday. And that's a commandment. Anyways, so, uh, so, uh, so yeah, so I think so. The first one uh, is taking into that account of, in order to grow in virtue, that that takes thinking about who you want to be and who God is calling you to be, and then kind of the second piece of it is um, the idea of God's will. And and you talk a little bit about this in the book, and maybe you can expand upon it. And it's something that that I've struggled with, you know, especially as we're discerning of whether to get out of the military or not, and what does that look like, and you know, I'm, I'm a soldier by trade. And so I just do orders, like just give me the order and I will just run full speed into battle or, or with my airplane full speed into battle. And so, so it's hard when, when it comes down to like, no, well, what makes you happy? Who do you want to be? And I'm like, these are questions I've never had to ask myself ever. I just (laughs) do the thing that you tell me to do. And so that's hard when I, you know, I bring that into my uh, my prayer life and my conversation with God. I'm like, God, just tell me what you want me to do. And I'll just go do the thing. God's kind of like, that's not how it works, you know? <laughs> so, um, so I don't know. Can you touch on uh, maybe a little bit of how to work in God's will into this piece and then with through the lens of who you want to become as you are making decisions? Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm thinking about the parable of the wheat and the tares right now. And why am I thinking about that? Because I think it's a good parable for interpreting how the will of God plays out in our lives. Right. So you recall 
master sends a servant into the field. They, they plant good seed. And then it says, you know, at the time when men sleep, uh, uh, someone came and sowed bad seed, sowed tares. Uh, and then, you know, everyone kind of comes together when things start poking up out of the ground. And the servants come back to the master and they're like, there's some weeds in here, chief. Did you give us bad seed? He's like, no, an enemy has done this. And they're like, all right, you want us to pull up the weeds? And he's like, no, just let them, let them grow together. And then at the end of the age, you can pull them both up, gather the wheat into the barns, and then bundle the tares together and then burn them with unquenchable fire. It's like, oh, unquenchable fire. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, but so why, why mention this? Well, there are certain things about the provenance of God and like the unfolding of God's will, which I think are just good to keep before our mind's eye. Namely, all of this takes place within the field, right? So God sees it all, right? God accounts for it all. In a certain sense, God causes it all. Second, um, God looks on it with care, looks on it with love. I love it that in the scriptures it says, at the time when men sleep. So it, it doesn't say that the master sleeps. And also when asked, you know, how did this happen? He says, an enemy has done this. He doesn't say, I guess that an enemy has done this, or I infer that an enemy has done this. He knows, right? So our Lord knows. Um, and also, like, he lets the things grow up together, uh, which I think for us is it's kind of like, well, why wouldn't you just get rid of the evil? Yeah. Why wouldn't you maximize? Why wouldn't you optimize? When St. Augustine reads the parable, he says, well, such is the grace of God that he can turn tares into wheat. And I think that for us, like, we, we often have too narrow of a frame of reference when we think about our decisions. We want to optimize, we want to maximize, we want to pull up all the weeds and make the wheat to grow. But the Lord's like, hey, you know, some of these weeds can become wheat, in fact, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, we, and we recognize this in our own lives when God permits a certain sin to befall. And mm -hmm. indirectly, a fruit of that sin is deeper conversion, um, you know, like a, a, an, an enrichment of our relationships, just a greater humility and sensitivity or mercy expressed towards others, whatever it might be. Um, but ultimately, like the whole point of it is to, to draw us into communion. The Lord's like, no, just just listen to my commands, right? Listen to my voice and the harvest will be rich. And the I mean, the harvest will be glorious indeed. So when it comes to like tuning into God's will, we recognize that this all takes place within the field, right? We're, we're all working within the context of his providence. And if you want to do the Lord's will, right? You're taking modest steps towards doing the Lord's will. You're, you're, you're going to get a knack for it, right? You're not going to like crack the code or skip to the back of the book and see all the answers, but you'll develop a capacity for it in time um, as befits human nature, which is to say like step by step. And then also like the things that may to you seem like failures or tragedies, may in fact redound to God's glory down the line. So Leon Blois mm -hmm. says the only tragedy is not to become a saint. So for us, like that's, that's the horizon. And everything mm -hmm. before that horizon is kind of free game. Like the Lord is, mm -hmm. the, he's kind of excited to see what you'll do with it, what will you do with the freedom that he's entrusted. Um, because he made you to give expression mm -hmm. to his glory in a free way. Yeah. So his will is that it unfold as such. And, um, yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm sure you have experience of that in your own life. Sometimes the unexpected is the most delightful or sometimes the unforeseen proves the most fruitful. And mm -hmm. yeah, we, just, we, just, we just have to learn that over time, I think. Yes. I mean, I, I, I kind of had this image of, you know, in, instead of God being this, uh, this all-knowing... Puppeteer. Puppeteer, right, yeah. And like, he's got all the answers and he's like, are you going to choose door A or door B? And you're like, door B, he's like, wrong answer. You're going to hell. Um, <laughs> slay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think about it more, um, man, maybe a, maybe a bad example, but, um, you know, teaching our, our one-year-old how to walk. And it's like, we're, we're giving her the tools to be able to do this. And, and then we just kind of sit back and, and watch and like, you know, every once in a while she might need like a little a guardrail to like, no, like, you know, don't, don't run into the hot stove or don't you know, so so he just kind of just kind of plays uh it just defense or puts up the boundaries and then he delights in where we go within that and 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 what we do with our free will and what we create and uh yeah i think um uh, we think of sometimes we don't think of god in, in those simple terms of the fact that he just delights to see what we're gonna do and and that's beautiful and fun mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think too, the truth that you've spoken to about how those tears sometimes do produce That's cool. incredible fruit. And 
absolutely that is my story. And absolutely at this last weekend I was on a retreat and just the focus on the idea that our wounds are the access point for Jesus. And so his wounds allow us to enter into his glory and vice versa. His Our wounds allow us to love better, to express mercy to others, to experience his love in a different way. And I think Sometimes we're very quick to rip those out or ignore them or to belittle that experience and say like that wasn't good. And yet how God can use that for his glory in our lives. Um, and yeah, I there, there's such a mystery in that that – and I'm not saying go out and plan a bunch of tears in your life. Like, okay, let's, uh, let's, let's act in some prudence. But <laughs> the reality is that we don't have to look back with that and the same shame, but yet allow that to be a place that can bring God's glory into our lives. I also wanted to touch a little bit on the different levels of happiness since Drew brought it up of of what we seek uh, and kind of for you to expand on when we're seeking happiness, what does that actually mean and what does our heart actually long for? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I mean, in the first chapter, I talked a little bit about meaning happiness and pleasure happiness. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's, you know, different people make different distinctions, all of which have their place, you know. I don't, I don't think that there's one definitive way to categorize happiness or like this is happiness and this is joy or this is felicity and this is beatitude and yada, yada, this and such. I think so long as you're pointing to the to the reality, then you can help orient people or spark good conversations. Um, so I think that, um, I mean, the question like concerning the meaning of life is a relatively modern question. Uh, it's like a 19th century question, honestly, when it first starts getting posed. Previously, it, it was more common in, philosophical and theological conversations to talk about the end of life, the goal of life. Mm -hmm. And um, the only reason I kind of hearken back to that is because we're human beings, right? We're, we're human beings with a human nature. And that means that there are particular ways in which we're going to be better disposed to, to live well, right? And as a result of which mm -hmm. to become good. So we begin with this basic uh, kind of foundational observation that we're not yet perfect. We're not yet complete. We're not yet whole. We have um, a kind of openness to that type of growth, but um, we need some help along the way. So we need to encounter the good things. And then we need to develop those habits of mind and heart, which help us to, you know, choose the good things and, and abide in the good things. And that's just, you know, what the life of virtue does. That's why we seek to cultivate it because it makes us to be fixed and what, like what, what, what makes us more real? I think that's probably, mm -hmm. if you were to describe it at that level, um, that might be the most kind of instinctual way of capturing the sense of what is happiness. Happiness is to have become more real. Happiness mm -hmm. is to have found the place where you fit, uh, where you can have this kind of um, relationship with reality on which you feed, from which you grow, however you want to describe it, right? Mm -hmm. um, so like, for you know, if I were to answer that question, if somebody were to pose the question to me, like, am I happy? I would say, in a sense, yes. Um, you know, do I experience sadness, loneliness, anxiety? Yeah, uh, absolutely, with great frequency. But I also have a kind of quiet conviction that I am where I ought to be, that I'm doing what I ought to do. Um, is that always true in the precise moment when it's posed? Uh, maybe not. Um, might I overdo it or underdo it at times? Yes, yeah, certainly. But I have like a basic sense that we're on the way and that the mm -hmm. Lord is blessing my life is blessing the fruit of, or the work of my hands. Um, and that I can trust him to continue to tell a beautiful story in my life. And I think that that's, that's kind of what I, that's what I want, uh, or that's what I hope to cultivate, um, to speak, mm -hmm. I guess, somewhat personally, but I don't know. Do you, do you find, I mean, you I'm just, you know, have conversations about happiness when it comes to like joy and happiness or like pleasure and meaning or wh whichever other distinction people draw, do you have ones that, that resonate with you or go to's? I really liked the pleasure and meaning that was used in the book. I especially, I you actually use this example, but I think the our culture would say the prudent choice uh, in family life is less kids uh, will result in higher happiness, and this idea that that pleasure, that instantaneous, I 
like reality and we don't see the purpose. And yet I know that each child, yes, has challenged me and grown me, but they've also brought a new level of joy. Drew describes it as the highs are higher and the lows are lower. Like just, uh, each, each, each kid, the amplitude like, just gets bigger. This gets bigger. And, but that <laughs> means the highs get bigger. Like in that reality of, I, I think we're so quick to choose the pleasure, to choose the glass of wine or the extra coffee or the uh, Netflix for four hours or whatever it is that we think will satisfy us, that we think will give us rest, that we think will bring us joy, and yet it leaves us with a headache and, (laughs) hey, I need another thing. Uh, And so this reality of what is our purpose and living with purpose and becoming you know, who God has created us to be. I think that that, I, oh, like need. Yes. Yeah. Just, just to yeah. add on to that and, and what you said again, really kind of resonated with mm-hmm. this concept of, of living in the moment and, and being peaceful and reassured that you are where God is called you to be. Yeah. And I mean, we have, we have such an epidemic of um, anxiety and depression and, and I'm not mm-hmm. trying to knock um, disorders. And I'm just trying to speak from my own heart of, of things that have helped me in my own mental wellness is um, there is a beauty in looking into the past and looking into your wounds and, and drawing and healing from those. There's a beauty in looking into the future, especially in um, grounding where you want to go, who you want to be, who God is calling you to be, but not dwelling in either of those, but really just being in the moment and being peaceful finding that rest in the Lord that I am where God has called me to be right now. And so when I get anxious in kind of other, either one of those categories, what grounds me is the fact that no, we have set a vision and a family culture for our family and God has called us to this. And I am certain that God wants us to become saints. So I can be certain in that. And then I can be certain that I'm doing the best I can and I'm just taking those baby steps and I'm every day I do the best I can. And when I hit the pillow, like I'm going to, try better tomorrow, but um, it's those little growth. I mean, God, grace builds on nature. And and it seems like that's how God works most of the time is that um, he wants us to become virtuous and that's going to be messy. Mm -hmm. And that's the way he designed it. That was the plan. I don't know why, but that's what he's got. So, (laughs) so, so I just kind of take comfort in the sense that, uh, that I'm, I'm on the path and, and um, yeah, and God's going to provide and take care. And, and if I, wander off the path. He's going to redirect the path and find a way back because because um, that's how he works. I don't know. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, St. Thomas has this beautiful example. Well, it's more of a philosophical explanation. He says, God isn't just like one cause in amongst a bunch of different causes. Um, because if he were, you know, then he would just try to make things better. He would just try to patch things up. Right. But God is the type of cause who takes in the whole network of causality and he's able to direct it, orchestrate it, kind of love it unto its, you know, kind of perfect end, its perfect fulfillment. So we'll say something like, even though we as individual causes might seem to depart from his will by transgression, yet strongly, sweetly, he makes us to return to his will by maybe punishment or maybe mercy mm-hmm. or mm-hmm. satisfaction. Like God has means whereby to draw us back in to like goad, invite, sway, persuade, you know, always appealing to our freedom and working in and through our freedom. Um, but we needn't fear, you know, that like it's all on us and it's really difficult. Yeah. And we have to crack the code and figure it out and find a way through mm-hmm. because as much as you want and love your destiny, God wants and loves it like a billion times more. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And his will for it is far more efficacious than ours. So, Since writing the book, uh, have you made any incredibly imprudent <laughs> decisions? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. No, no diggity, no doubt. Life is a highway, <laughs> as the wise poets Rascal Flats once sang, and I'm going to mess it up all night long. Yeah. Um, actually, this, this is like a, a kind of cool story insofar as it testifies to the idiocy of man and the mercy of God. <laughs> um, so backstory, my mother, um, she uh, was diagnosed with pancreas cancer a couple of years back, and she passed away about six months ago. Um, mm. But just an incredible woman, a really wonderful woman. 
mm-hmm. and uh, so, you know, a woman who, who cared very much that, that I'd be safe and that I'd be happy. Um, I had actually, so I'd backstory is I had been hiking at one point. I like to hike. I've, I, I take lots of opportunities to hike and, um, I'd been hiking at one point. I think at the time I was like 19 and I got lost. A friend and I got lost a mutual friend actually of uh, Drew's brother. Um, so Bobby <laughs> Hogan and I got lost hiking and, um, at a certain point I had like a little bit of cell phone reception and we had been lost at this point for a while. Uh, so we, we used that cell phone reception to call search and rescue who, who subsequently told us, you know, we're not coming for you. You're hosed. It's like, great, good, good chat. Um, but I thought actually about calling my, my family. Um, but at that point they could have done nothing and it would have just caused them anxiety. So there was no sense really in doing it. And it wasn't like we were going to die within the next couple hours. So, you know, we'll, we'll get, we'll get reception again right before we die. No problem. Okay. So, uh, whoop, let's go back to the present moment. This is November of this past year. Uh, I was hiking. I live in Switzerland. I was hiking in the Swiss Alps in a canton called Valais. And I left from this town called Fionnet. And I hiked this big mountain called the Becca de Courroisier. Uh, but when I left the house, I realized like 30 minutes into the drive that I'd forgotten snowshoes, which is kind of essential for winter hiking. But I was like, you know what? I'll just go up as high as I can and then turn around when I'm exhausted. And it'll be fine. So I started at like 1,500 meters. And I actually was cruising because I was in the sunny side of the mountain for most of the morning. And I got to this little coal, like this little saddle between mountains. At like 3,000 meters, right about 130, and I was like, boom, didn't need snowshoes because, I mean, the snow hadn't been that deep up until that point. And then I'm going descending on the other side, and the descent on the other side is basically like you're tacking down. It's not a cliff face, but it's really sheer. So it's not like you can just gamble down this mountain however you darn well please, you know, like it's all caprice and whimsy. Woo-hoo. No, you need to like know the path. Okay, great. Also, at this point, shady side of the mountain. No longer are we dealing with a few inches of snow. We're dealing with a few feet of snow. So at certain points, I'm getting like, you know, waist deep. And then I start hearing uh, what sound like either F-16s or avalanches. Hard to say one or the other. Never really had certainty regarding it. But it was great. So as I'm descending the mountain, you know, all at this point, all of the, the trail markers are covered. And um, there's quite a bit of snow. I'm nervous about avalanches. And I I lose reception on my phone, which ordinarily isn't that big of a deal because it's not like I'm making conference calls from the top of a mountain. But um, my my app has GPS location for like placing me on uh, the the topographical map. And so it's just really easy to navigate with that when it works. Otherwise, you kind of have to have a better sense for like dead reckoning, which, you know, I don't have the best, but it's whatever. Okay, so. Um, I'm trying not to make a big mistake because I'm having difficulty following the trail. So I'm tacking back up and down along the line where I know there to have been or to be trail markers, but I keep coming up against like a cliff face every time I like Mm. take what I think might be the trail. And, uh, at this point it's like two, two 30, three, three 30. And I'm still at 2,700 meters and I have to get back to my car at whatever I said, like 1600. And, uh, I'm getting nervous. Like I'm getting, I'm getting a little bit scared. So at that point I was like, I'm an imprudent fool. Lord have mercy. Um, and, but I had the thought, like the last time I thought to call my mom, uh, she couldn't do anything and it would have stressed her out. Now she can do something and it won't stress her out. So I prayed to my mom and literally completing the prayer within mm-hmm. just a couple of seconds, I saw another trail marker that I hadn't seen for the past two hours. I walked to that trail marker and just beyond it, I saw a set of footprints. And the thing that was awesome is that the set of footprints originated there. Right. So they didn't keep going up the mountain. There were a set of footprints that started right there, (laughs) which is awesome. So at that Uh, point, you know, I'm just praying and I'm just like, all right, Ma, don't let these footprints end. Don't let these footprints end. I'm just (laughs) tacking down this cliff. And it's just like, it's very apparent that did you not know the path? You're not going to make it down this thing in one piece. Um, So I'm still like, I'm using like compass, altimeter, map. I'm using all all the tools that I have in my little tool, tool case. And um, just like basing it off different land, blah, blah, blah. Okay. I eventually made my way down the mountain. Thanks be to God. And it was wild too, because the set of footprints, it was like human footprints for a while. And then they would veer off the trail. And then it was like small woodland creature footprints. And then they would veer off the trail. And then it was like, it was crazy. At a certain point, I was like, I have no idea what's going on. Lord, mom, anybody, but (laughs) cheers to you guys. And I literally, I hit the valley floor right as the lights were coming on in the city. So like, it was incredible. So Ought I to have been in that situation? No, I should have brought my snowshoes or I should have gotten back and like, you know, collected them. I should have downloaded the topographical map so I could have used it online. I probably shouldn't be hiking in the Alps in the middle of the winter, like to begin with. I mean, like there's so many things about this decision making (laughs) process, which are just beyond dumb, but like. 
that's it. Like the point of my life isn't to optimize or maximize. I, I hope I don't die because then it gets real, you know, hairy. I mean, explaining that, it's no, no good. But like, I mean, I, I just, I had this experience that just very much convinced me of the mercy of God. My mother's like ongoing and continued love and solicitude for me, even beyond the grave, you know? So yeah, the Lord's telling a good story and uh, it's just for us to, you know, participate in the sharing thereof. Well, I'm I'm glad you didn't die because I don't know if your book on prudence would have been published if you had died imprudently. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you so. to Father, Father Gregory Pine's mom wow. up there. Yes. God, that's right. Right. Um, right. That's session. Awesome. Yeah. So, um, man, uh, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Again, for all of our listeners, um, please uh, get the book. Father, what is the book called and, and where can they find it? <laughs> yeah, it's called Prudence. Choose confidently, live boldly, and you can find it wherever books are sold, unless it's not there. And then you can find it in another place where books are sold. Um, so Amazon.com being the most surefire bet. Yeah. So to our listeners, if you want to learn how to make good decisions with your life, then then you need to just hop on your 1970s snowmobile and just go for a full send and just buy this book because it is really <laughs> awesome. Um, we appreciate it. So, yes. um, Father Gregory, fine. What a where? Uh, where else can people find out what you got going on? Um, and where can they connect with you? Yeah, um, I contribute to, like you said, Pints with Aquinas, um, which is where all you know podcasts are available on YouTube. I, I just contribute actually on the YouTube side, and then with four of the Dominican friars, I contribute to a podcast. A podcaning. Gosh, Lord, <laughs> please give me the faculty of speech for yet four more minutes. Amen. Um, it's called <laughs> Podcaning. Podcast. And um, I mean, it's like, you know, your ordinary podcast experience, kind of Catholic miscellany. Um, and then um, we actually have retreats this summer, which is great. So a retreat, for all summer, a retreat for young adults, a retreat for young men, like wilderness retreat. And those are in July and August. And that's all on godsplanning.org. And then, uh, yeah, that's, that's basically it. So thanks. Oh, sounds wonderful. Hopefully you will not lead them up too many paths that they cannot get back down in the wilderness. <laughs> yeah. One of my best friends, Father Bonaventure, whenever I do something stupid, he's always like, you know, you should really read a book about prudence. <laughs> <laughs> it's I'm like, Thanks, I go. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, we got a good one for you. <laughs> uh, well, again, thank you so much for coming on the show for all our listeners. Yes. Go ahead and check out uh, the links in the description, especially for the book and everything that uh, Father Gregory has going on. And so um, for all of you guys out there, thank you for listening. Again, we're praying for you all until next time. God bless. <laughs>